The discovery of transfer printing in the mid-18th century created a whole new line of artistic expression for ceramics. Hand painting was tedious and it could be expensive, but with transfer printing you could take really intricate designs and details and apply it multiple times to different forms of vessels. This included scenes from pastoral life, commemorative events from British and American history like the death of George Washington, as well as the influence of Chinese and Japanese porcelain, so different types of blue willow scenes. Now, one of the really important factors of transfer printing or transferware production was the fact that it could be mass produced. So now these different vessels are being sent around the world, most of which is being produced and sent from Staffordshire, England. A lot of these particularly are being made for the American market and made their way here to Fort Ticonderoga. Welcome back to another episode of From the Ground Up. My name is Margaret Stouter. I'm the Registrar and Site Archaeologist here at Fort Ticonderoga. And for this episode, we are looking at transferware. Now, the cataloging and photography of our archaeological transferware collection, as well as our decorative arts collection, has been made possible from a grant funded by the Transferware Collectors Club, so we're very grateful to them for that. And because of this work, we are able to share the records that we have cataloged on the Ticonderoga Online Collections database for anyone to look at and see. Now when you think of transferware, you probably think of the 19th and 20th centuries, but when you think of Fort Ticonderoga, you probably think of the 18th century, since this was a military site from 1755 to 1781. However, because uh, the ruins that were here and the beautiful landscape, we had a lot of travelers that came to the site in the 19th century, and we also had a home built on the property by a man named William Ferris Pell in 1826. And this home, called the Pavilion, uh, was used as a family summer home, but it was also turned into a hotel in the 19th century and would have had a lot of guests staying at it. Today, that building, the Pavilion, is a National Historic Landmark uh, and is in the process of finishing a restoration. And during that work, we discovered even more transferware here on the property. Uh, so through our cataloging efforts, we've learned a lot about the different types of transferware ceramics that were being utilized on the site. Now, transferware, transfer printing, uh, had a start in the 18th century, first with the Italians, but it was really developed and utilized by the English, uh, starting by the mid-18th century, and really popularized by the early 19th century. There's two different types of printing. There's overglaze printing and underglaze printing. And with overglaze printing, you are going to take your engraved plate that has beautiful images on it, and you're going to take a bat of gelatinous glue, and you're going to press that onto an oiled engraved plate. The glue bat is going to now have the oiled design on it, and that would be transferred, pressed into your vessel. Uh, the vessel would then have a pigment, a dusted pigment put onto it, and it would be fired at a low temperature to adhere it to the outside of the vessel. With underglaze printing, you're going to have a biscuit vessel, which is a fired piece of ceramic that doesn't have a glaze on it. And at this point, they are now utilizing a very thin tissue that is pressed onto the engraved plate, which has pigment now on it, so your color, and that is then transferred, pressed onto your unglazed vessel. It is then glazed and then fired. So the print, your transfer, is underneath the glaze. And this was really great because it kept that image um, nice and hardy underneath the glaze and wouldn't adhere or rub off. Now, uh, the most popular color to start off with was blue, so your white and blue patterns. And this was really heartening back to your um, Chinese porcelain that was being imported into England um, in the early 17th, 18th centuries. And the sort of imitation of that that comes through your tin glazed earthenwares and different types of ceramics before the advent of transfer printing. But with transfer printing, they're still looking at that color combo. And what's interesting about the artifacts that are found here at Fort Ticonderoga is we have a variety of colors which included other popular um, colors of red or your burgundy, um, browns, blacks, greens, but our largest number of artifacts that have a color to them are the blue and white. Now, you would also get lots of different scenes printed on them, and with transfer printing, you could really mix and match the different uh, scenes and details that you're putting on things like plates, your tea sets, uh, water jugs, anything from a very small vessel all the way to a really big vessel could have these wonderful images with very, very intricate designs now put on them. And with your mixing and matching, uh, you might be able to create plate sets that would have a theme but have different images in the center. So they'd all have a uniform border, and that would be its own transfer that had been cut out and applied. And then you could take your engraved plate that has scenes from Europe or scenes from an American or British battle, and that could then be placed into the middle of it. So you'd be able to create these beautiful sets. 
and these are then being produced for the most part in Staffordshire, England, where the advent of pottery um, production in the 18th century had really grown, and these are then being sent off to Europe, and also particularly being made for the American market. So there's a lot of potters that have established themselves by the 1820s, 30s, and 40s in Staffordshire, but they're also then establishing stores over here in America so that they can bring their wares over and sell them. Now, a lot of the pieces that we have here at Fort Ticonderoga date from that first half of the 19th century. Uh, there's a few that date later, but it's interesting that a lot of them date from this first half, and they have some really wonderful designs on them. It speaks to the Romantic era that a lot of the potters are looking towards, that culture had really been adapting from different stories and art. Uh, so there's a lot of pieces that have some wonderful images on them, but we also have some great maker's marks as well that tell us about who was making these pieces. So now we're going to take a little bit closer look at some of our archaeological pieces. So looking a little bit closer at our transferware, this piece here is a part of a plate rim. It has a flower, um, black or dark brown um, design on white with a geometric border closer to the rim, and it doesn't necessarily tell us a lot about what uh, this piece is or who made it, um, but luckily we do have another piece in our collection that has the same pattern. Um, so you can see the flower matches here, and luckily this larger piece mends with the center of a plate, which shows us um, this very sort of moody gothic scene of some old architecture uh, and a tree. There's a little um, sort of town in the background here. We have a bridge, but when we turn this over, we have the maker's mark on the back, which gives us wonderful information on this piece. So this is ironstone, uh, which is a type of ceramic. It doesn't have any iron in it, um, but it has a very hard durable quality to it, so it was a good cheap um, sort of version for people who could not afford porcelain. Uh, the maker's mark has a outstretched eagle. It says Leipzig underneath it, which was a um, is a town in Saxony in Germany, and underneath that it says J. Clemenson, and that is the name of the potter uh, in this case. So uh, the scene that is on the front of this piece is a very nice romantic rendering of Leipzig in Germany, um, which is also where in 1813 uh, Napoleon was defeated. Um, and Clemenson was a Staffordshire potter working in Hanley uh, from around 1838 to 1864. So that gives us a, a good sort of date range as to when um, this plate would have been uh, brought over and purchased and used here on the property. Now uh, we have a few cases uh, and this is one of them where we have sherds that show there was multiples of these plates being bought. So just today as you would have a place setting of multiple plates of one pattern, so were they uh, doing as well. So sometimes we find sherds that match the pattern. So here is one that fits right in there. So you can see that um, little part of um, structure that's on the bridge there matches right there to this piece. So another version of that that we have that occurs with a sort of doubling of our plates comes from another European scene, and this is um, the merino pattern um, that has some variations uh, between some different potters as well. Um, this one uh, likely coming from um, Thomas Phillips, um, who was working in Burslem in Staffordshire from 1845 or so to 1846. Um, and again, this is most likely ironstone. Um, but this is Marino, which was a town around um, 13 miles south of Rome. It was one of the Grand Tour stops. Um, so not necessarily having a lot of money uh, for middle and lower classes to be able to travel, they could certainly still see these places that are being written about, that are being seen in art and prints, um, but this time they can see them through what they're eating off of, their, their plateware. Um, and again, we have a little fragment here that is the same piece of pattern um, from the larger fragment. And uh, just like our previous fragments, these two here um, that mend, do you have a bit of a maker's mark. So able to then deduce who made this by some of the information on the back of this, even though it's broken, um, it says N Sons and it says Burslem. So then being able to look at a list of um, both maker's mark designs, but also what the different names of potters that were working in Burslem, um, and then being able to decipher some of the patterns that they were making. 
So that is the merino pattern. And that one was by uh, likely Thomas Phillips and Sons, but there is a George Phillips who is also working, creating a similar merino pattern, a little bit different. And here's his version of it. And you'll notice, uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, quite a bit of blue and white transfer wear. It was very popular. Um, definitely looking back at some of the Chinese porcelain or even the Delft wear from the Netherlands that was being produced and was incredibly popular and being reproduced over the 18th century um, by English potters. Uh, that's still very popular blue and white pottery persists even into um, the production of transfer wear. So even though these are a little bit smaller, uh, we have a fountain here. There's some more sort of gothic old buildings and a tree. Um, so very similar to uh, the um, pattern that was being made by Thomas Phillips. But um, based off of some research, uh, this design here being incorporated into George Phillips's merino patterns. Now to go a little bit closer in, do a zoom in here. Um, this is perhaps my favorite piece um, that has been found here archaeologically. It's so small and it shows this sort of Gothic Romanesque architecture. There's a little bridge in the background, but when we turn it over, there's this mark on the back, and it's not a maker's mark, it's a registration mark, uh, which is what the RD stands for in the middle. And registration marks were started to be required by the British Patent Office uh, starting around 1842. And there's a set of different um, dates depending on the way the letters and characters fall within the diamond. Um, but this one falls from 1842 to 1883. Uh, and the number, the Roman numerals on the top here, um, was the class for which this patent was made. So uh, four being for clayware. The C uh, was the year code. Um, so they started this in 1842, which would have been A. 1843 would have been B. So C is 1844. Uh, number five has to do with the number of patents that were being bundled together um, by the potter who was registering it. But the I and the 20 are important because that gives us the day. So this I stands for July and the 20th. So this was registered on July 20th. 1844, uh, and you're able to look through the British Patent Office, um, design patents, and, and find who was registering them. So this one, uh, most likely to John uh, Ridgway, um, who was working in Staffordshire at Cauldron Place, um, and this is a possible variation of a pattern of the Doria um, pattern that he was making. Um, but it's just so wonderful. You find uh, registration marks sometimes, but um, a lot of the fragments that we have uh, don't have it. This is really the only one where I've seen especially a full registration mark, um, but it, it really ties this pattern um, to a time and place, to 1844. Um, so it gives this um, piece as well, the, the production of this piece a date. Um, it gives it a date for when it might have been or close to a date when it would have been used here on the property. Um, but it also signaled um, copyright protection. It was a way for potters and designers to be able to um, keep their designs to themselves. Um, though so, of course, they were also being used by others and um, sometimes would be bought by others. But this is just a remarkable little find since it has, um, has that registration date on it. So with keeping looking at blue and white um, transfer wear, we have a water jug here, two fragments that um, end together. Um, it's sort of hard to see, but there is a woman here with a sheep. Um, she's kneeling down next to the sheep. And then these two pieces mend, and you can see um, part of the other woman that um, is there. There's her hand and her um, neckerchief there. And this is part of a water jug that was made by Davenport who was a family of potters working in Longport, Staffordshire from around 1794 to 1887. Uh, so this gives these pieces a much longer possible um, usage period and then um, date for being deposited here archeologically on the site. Um, but they're a great example of that very bucolic pastoral scenes that are being incorporated uh, into transfer wear prints and imagery. Now, one of the other popular designs was um, based off of our Chinese, Japanese porcelain, um, which of course has a very heavy influence on English pottery production, um, as well as Delftware, 
uh, which was coming from the Netherlands, and then the English are making their own version of Delfware uh, with tin glazed earthenware, but a lot of the designs were um, definitely looking back at some of the um, chinoiserie patterns are blue willow patterns, so imagery from um, Chinese porcelain of buildings and people um, and plants, and then taking those hand-painted designs and making um, etchings, different prints of them, and that's then being used for our transfer wear prints. Um, and what's interesting is that even though this is an incredibly popular pattern, um, different blue willow patterns that are being utilized by different potters, the collection here, our archaeological collection, doesn't actually have a lot of um, chinoiserie patterns. We have the fragments in front of us here of this plate and I think maybe two or three teacup fragments, um, but for the most part it's a lot of floral borders, a lot of those um, sort of Italianate buildings, European scenes, um, and less of the chinoiserie. So that last example, very much copying traditional Chinese uh, porcelain patterns, this pattern here, much more of a sort of English style, um, but still looking at um, that sort of Chinese influence of the buildings, um, some of these uh, flowers, this almost looks like a chrysanthemum, um, and some of the plants as well. And when we turn this over, it gives us an idea of who is making it. There is a maker's mark here of a shield with a ship in it and there's a um, anchor that goes through it. Um, and luckily for the pattern name too, we're just able to make out the letters J-A-P for Japan. Um, and this is Japan Flowers is the name of this pattern. Um, and luckily with the Transfer Collectors Club database, they have a lot of their patterns, um, excuse me, their maker's marks specifically as well, um, divvied up into different um, emblems that are included in the maker's mark. So there's a nautical one, for instance, which helped me identify this maker's mark. Um, and this is from Widgeway Morley Ware & Co. Um, from around 1836 to 1842, who are also working in Hanley, Staffordshire. Um, but in this case, again, adapting that um, sort of chinoiserie style, but I would say with a little bit more of a sort of English um, flair to it with certainly some of the flowers that have been incorporated in here. Um, and we know the name of this pattern because they tell us very nicely on the back of it, but it does help us for identifying some other fragments that we have, like the bottom of a matching tea bowl that would have gone with it. So you can see um, the flower matches up very nicely, um, some of the rest of the color pattern um, and some of the buildings match as well. So this is the bottom of a um, tea bowl or a teacup that has no maker's mark on it, but it is um, matching the scene that is on this little plate that would have matched it. And this company was making this pattern in both regular plateware, but also um, teaware as well. Now, a lot of our patterns have flowers in them, it has imagery, buildings. Uh, a few of our patterns, though, that we have are just geometric, different um, shapes, and one of those is this plate that we have here that is transfer printed but just has these blue decorations. And here's the center of the plate. Um, and like some of the other examples I have showed, this one too has a maker's mark on the bottom of it. And though they don't perfectly match up, it gives us just enough information to be able to discern who this is. Um, and this is from uh, Ridgeway and Sons, which was a pottery from around 1838 to 1848. Um, again, I think, believe, uh, working in Hanley. Um, and this is the Tudor style, this Tudor pattern. Um, and just using this nice blue and white, but it doesn't have any people or imagery. So speaking of floral borders, here is one from Enoch Wood, and this shows the red or um, burgundy color that was also popular. So we have our blue, we saw a green, um, we also looked at a sort of dark um, brown, black version, um, and this is a red. And this is a great example of really being able to see where those transfer prints 
um, stopped and ended. For the most part, if they were really well done, they'd look pretty seamless, like it had been painted or etched on there. Um, but in this case, you can see the line from where the tissue ended. And this is usually a great indication that the vessel you're looking at has transfer printing on it because the paper has left um, that markation of where it has ended. Um, and this is from a European scenery piece uh, from Enoch Wood, who was working from around 1818 to 1846, again in Staffordshire. Now, for the most part, the pieces we've looked at have ranged from um, around the early part of the 1820s or so through the 1840s and 60s, um, but I did want to show one later piece here. Um, and this is the Grace Pattern by um, F. Winkle and Company, who is working in Stoke in Staffordshire from around 1890 to 1931. Um, there's just some brown flowers, very simple along the rim of this uh, small little plate. Again, it has a maker's mark here on the back with the big W and an F in the middle, which helps us uh, give a name to who was making this. So this is from a later period of the pavilion when it was still being used as a hotel. Um, it was known as the Pavilion Hotel, the Fort Ticonderoga Hotel, um, really being used from 1839 um, up into the 1890s as a hotel and then it turns over um, to a farm for quite a while before uh, Stephen Pell and his wife Sarah resume um, the Pell residences there around 1908-1909. Um, but this was deposited sometime in the late part of the 19th century or early 20th century. So the last piece we're going to look at here is a fragment of a plate that features a painting that is from the collections here. This is a painting by Harry Ogden. It shows uh, General Montcalm congratulating the troops after their success at the Battle of Carrion. And it also has this very nice thick traditional transfer wear floral border. Uh, and this was produced for our gift shop here to sell to visitors that were coming and visiting the fort by the company Wedgwood. And the name Wedgwood might sound familiar. Josiah Wedgwood uh, was a very famous potter and he started the Wedgwood Company in the 18th century. He really helped popularize creamware. He had royal patronage and a lot of his designs uh, and patterns became very popular in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, so this was produced by that company, which is still exists today, for the gift shop here. looked at here will be available on the Ticonderoga Online Collections database, so you can see uh, photographs of the images and, and look at the details, and there's also some information uh, with the makers that are associated with the pieces. Uh, but transferware was uh, really just a, a great advancement in pottery, being able to include some of these amazing drawings um, now on vessels with all of their details, uh, the use of different colors, uh, and because of the industrial age in the 19th century, uh, being able to mass produce these, send them all over the world, uh, and also because they were cheaply made, now you had all sorts of different social groups being able to buy vessels, different pieces of pottery um, that had these wonderful, wonderful stories and designs on them uh, for them to see and use. Thank you for joining us for another episode of From the Ground Up. To learn more about upcoming events, you can visit our website at www.fortticonderoga.org and you can also follow us on social media through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to keep up to date with different projects that we are working on. Thank you so much for your support and I look forward to seeing you next time.